welcome. This is our second session. Uh, we're going to hear from our historians this time around. Um, for those who haven't met me, I'm Dick Nelson. I'm on faculty at Anglo Commerce. Um, I do a lot of teaching methods in local history. I do a lot of East Texas history, and history stuff. Uh, and so we're trying to get a little more involved with our students, get some of that stuff. Um, and I'm really glad to be able to sponsor these uh, events with local history, right? So, I'm going to introduce two people to y'all, right? So, first of all, I want to introduce uh, Sam Tullock. He is with Collin County College, and he has been there for a little while. He's pretty comfortable at this point, we might say. Um, part of the most important things to say about him is he has his uh, PhD from uh, UT Dallas in 1997. He's interested in his topic because it goes back to his growing up in Waxahachie. Uh, he is a man with a voice for radio. And so we're always glad to hear from him. Um, and so we'll hear, from, we'll hear from him first, and he'll be talking to us about what's happening in uh, Ellis County, right? Not right now, but in the past, right? <laughs> I'll let him give you the full rundown of that. And after that, we will hear from Andrew Baker. Uh, he is on faculty also at AM Commerce. Um, he does a lot of work with cotton history, environmental history. Uh, he's been with us at Commerce for Four or five years? Six years? Uh, maybe it's, I, I've lost track. I 2015. Um, so again, he's comfortably in, installed, and we're very glad to have him there. Um, and so we've got these two great things, and uh, Baker is going to speak to us uh, about compromising cotton fields. So we get a little bit of the environmental history here. So without further ado, let me ask Sam to come forward, and he'll get us started. I've only missed one of these conferences, I think, in all these years. Um, I had a nephew who had the audacity of getting married on uh, the Saturday we were supposed to have this, so I had to set some priorities there. I was telling Kyle not long ago over lunch how much I've enjoyed through the years, not only hearing the scholars, but also seeing the faces of people that remind me a great deal of my own growing up on the Blackland Prairie. Uh, and it seems like we see fewer and fewer of those faces, how much I miss uh, those mature people that uh, bring such a wonderful uh, dimension to all of this. And he proceeded to uh, uh, remind me that I am now one of those people. So <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Wilkerson, for your unfailing uh, friendship and encouragement. <laughs> he probably did say we, uh, but the story wouldn't have been as good if I'd have said that. <laughs> I must begin this presentation with a personal, uh, several personal words of, of appreciation. Two books of my colleagues, uh, who are also, I'm grateful to say, my friends, and provided some wonderful background information. Dr. Keith Bellato and Dr. Wilkinson, as well as the weekly conversations I enjoy with my colleagues at the Plano campus, Keith and Kyle, of course. And Roger and Rachel, and if I'm accidentally leaving someone out, uh, please forgive. I owe a special word of thanks to Dr. Or Professor Larry Stern, who provided invaluable assistance in uh, accessing, accessing articles in the Waxhatchee Daily Light. Uh, each week, my wife and I retreat to the country to fellowship with people of the land in Altoga, Texas, the northern part of Collin County and I'm grateful for them. I'm grateful and want to give special thanks to the director and staff of the museum. Above all, I'm grateful for my country girl, Kathy Tullock, who is here with me this morning, who's patiently endured nearly 48 years of marriage <laughs> to a small town boy. And I'm always Sam and Bert's boy, son. I was raised in Waxhatchee, Texas, the son of a Baptist preacher and wife, Sam and Roberta Tullock. The glory days of the Blackland cotton boom were long over during my adolescence, but I knew many farmers and ranchers, most of them members of my dad's church. During my first years of education in Waxhatchee, segregation still plagued the school district. For weal or woe, I am a child of that country, county seat, Blackland Prairie, 
And this presentation for me has, uh, is a remembrance of what seems now a rather distant way of life. This brief overview of the film Places in the Heart is not a tribute to that culture, just a reminiscence. Academy Award winning screenwriter and director Robert Douglas Benton was born in Waxhatchee in 1932. In 1984, Benton released his film Places in the Heart, a fictional account of the Depression era hardships of a recently widowed mother, Miss Edna Spaulding, played by Sally Fields. The movie is, in my judgment, the crowning achievement of a distinguished career a career that took this celebrated and creative man back to his roots in Ellis County, Texas. Benton was the son of Ellery Douglas Benton, a telephone company employee, and Dorothy Spaulding Benton. I might add, I never knew any of the Bentons, but I knew a lot of the Spaulding's. The Spaulding family was still there when I was a kid growing up. Miss Spaulding, uh, Benton's mother was the child of a very prominent family. After graduating from Waxhatchee High School, Benton earned degrees from the University of Texas and Columbia University and served in the U.S. Army. In the late 1950s, he became the art director for Esquire magazine before turning his creative skills to feature-length films in the mid-1960s. He wrote the screenplay for Bonnie and, Cl Bonnie and Clyde, 1967 release, and several scenes of the film were shot in Waxahachie. In 1979, Benton wrote and directed the Academy Award winning film Kramer vs. Kramer, and four years later, in September of 1983, he began location filming in and around Waxahachie for Places in the Heart. For a time, Waxahachie became sort of the Hollywood of Texas, a popular venue for several award-winning films. I mentioned Bonnie and Clyde, of course, a few minutes ago, starring Faye Dunaway, Warren Beatty, Gene Hackman, and Estelle Parsons. I was still in junior high when that film was shot in Waxahachie, and I can't tell you how uh, enthusiastic and joyful the people were in Waxahachie that Bonnie and Clyde were finally getting their due. Bonnie and Clyde had held up the Garrity Bank in Waxahachie twice, not once, but we were very special people. <laughs> in 1963, Tender Mercies uh, was shot in Waxahachie, in, in and around Waxahachie, starring Robert Duvall, Tess Harper, Ellen Barkin, and Wilford Brimley, who later, who later married a Waxahachie girl that I went to high school with. Not in the movie, but in real life. Uh, in 1985, A Trip to Bountiful was shot again in and around Waxahachie, starring Geraldine Page and John Hurd. Places in the Heart traces the hardships and triumphs of, triumphs of Miss Edna Spaulding in the aftermath of her husband's death. In the opening scene, Sheriff Roy Spaulding was accidentally shot by a drunken African-American teenager named Wiley. Left with a mortgage due to the during the Depression, Miss Edna had to figure out a way to pay her debts or face the loss of her home and two children. She took in two boarders, a blind World War II veteran named Mr. Will and an African-American transient named Mose. Miss Spaulding decided to raise cotton on her 40 acres of land, and in desperation she hoped to earn an extra $100 by bringing in the first cotton crop in Ellis County of the season. The film centers on Miss Edna's struggles to save her home and her family during the cotton crash of the 1930s. The film boasts an extraordinary cast. Sally Fields, as I mentioned earlier, plays Edna Spaulding, the widow of the sheriff who was killed in the opening scenes of the movie. Danny Glover plays Mose a transient Af African-American who helps Edna bring in a, crop, a cotton crop and endures the violent harassment of the Ku Klux Klan. John Malkovich played Mr. Will, a blind tenant in the Spaulding household. Lindsey Krauss plays Edna's sister, Margaret Lomax, and a long-suffering wife of womanizing husband, Wayne Lomax, played by Ed Harris. 
Amy Madigan plays Violet uh, Kelsey, a friend of Miss Edna and Margaret, who had an adulterous affair with Wayne Lomax, Margaret's husband. And Benton also included many Waxhatchee citizens uh, as the extras. Those of you that grew up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area may have some recollection of this. There was a well-known TV, local per, uh, well-known TV personality in this area whose name was Jerry Haynes. When Kathy and I were growing up in the area, he had a children's program called Mr. Peppermint. Mm -hmm. Do any of you remember that? Mm -hmm. Well, he's in this film, uh, plays a deputy uh, marshal or deputy sheriff in the uh, in the film. I particularly found the movie track soundtrack compelling, though it's somewhat sparse and in that sense a little bit disappointing. Doc and Merle Watson, some of my favorites, uh, play two different versions of Cotton Eye Joe in the film, and the second slower version, in my judgment, is particularly compelling. The surviving members of the Texas Playboys are also in the film. The old members, the surviving members of Bob Wills' old country swing uh, band. The film also includes many old revival style hymns that of course uh, touch uh, deep memories in my mind and heart. The film includes also a limited visual tour of Waxhatchee landmarks. You'll pardon a Waxhatchee native that I was deeply saddened that the movie did not include more of the uh, of at least still shots of the iconic buildings, the Chautauqua and Getson Dana Park the old Sims Library, Ferris Avenue, Marvin, and Wildman Schools, or any of the 12 or 14 gingerbread houses that date back to the late 19th and early 20th century. They do include in the film, though, several photographs of the Ellis County Courthouse that was completed in 1897. It's iconic. The Ellis County Courthouse has become the symbol, in a sense, of the Waxhatchee community. Benton included several still shots of the courthouse, including the facial images uh, around the courthouse and the facade of the courthouse. That's the object of a great deal of Waxhatchee folklore. If you want to hear the folklore, I can tell you over lunch. I don't think any of it's true. <laughs> the Rogers Hotel uh, also is in the film. Uh, the banking scenes were shot in this historic building. Located on the city square, the hotel was originally built in 1882 and refurbished in 1914. The Bethel United Methodist Church also plays a prominent role in the film. The final scene of the film was shot in this historic building. It was erected in 1907. One of the graveyard scenes was shot in the church cemetery and the dance hall scene was filmed in, in the old tabernacle adjacent to the, uh, to the church building. The Five Points Cotton Gin plays an important role in the film as well. Located a few miles south, I'm, uh, I'm recollecting this from my adolescence, I would say about six miles south west of Waxhatchee, the Five Points Gin still stands today apparently. I've seen recent photographs. It was one of several gins in cotton yards that serviced the needs of cotton farmers in the area in 1935, the setting of the film. The city also had a cotton mill, uh, a major employer in Ellis County, until it closed in 1935. In the screenplay, Edna Spaulding purchased cotton seed from the Five Points Cotton Gin and later negotiated with the shady proprietor of the gin for a reasonable price for, uh, for her crop with the help of her Tenant Moe's. Keith, where are you? I don't know why this stands out in me, but they negotiated a price at 3.75 cents a, a pound, I think it was. That's low. <laughs> well, yeah. I think I, he was trying to under, the, this gin operator was trying to undercut her even. I think he thought he could take advantage. She sure. apparently was thrilled to get 3.75. Mm -hmm. But a, you and I need to visit, you need to help me know how bad the cotton prices got in the sure. mid-30s because it, it apparently was, was quite bad. Yeah. It, pardon the private conversation. 
In my judgment, the most poignant scene in the film occurs shortly after Miss Edna and Moe sell their cotton to the gin manager. Angered by Moses' involvement, the gin owner and several Ku Klux Klan members assault Moe's in the Spalding barn. Mr. Will, the blind tenant, intervenes by firing pistol shots toward the sound of the Klansmen. The scene piqued my interest in the history of the Klan in Ellis County during the 1930s. According to historian Charles Alexander, the new Klan membership grew dramatically in Texas during the early 1920s. And the Klan dens were established throughout the state, including formidable organizations in both Dallas and Fort Worth. Several respected uh, Texas historians have observed that the new Klan appealed for a time to the middle class, urban people, including community and religious leaders. While the Klan enjoyed a brief unsettling popularity, by the end of the 1920s, the invisible empire was in serious decline. However, I have no doubt that the Klan influence continued well past 1930. The Waxhatchee Daily Light, the local newspaper, uh, of course in Waxhatchee, published several pro-Klan articles throughout the 1920s, including announcements of local uh, Klan meetings. Uh, again, a special thanks to Professor Larry Stern for helping me with uh, these articles. In 1929, the paper ran this announcement. Klan, Klansman notice, important meeting, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, tomorrow night at the hall. All members urged to be present as very important matters will be up for consideration by the membership by order of the Cyclops, in quotations. Earlier articles throughout the 1920s discussed the Klan's ambivalence about Ma and Pa Ferguson, defended the group's Christian orthodoxy, which I have in quotation marks in my paper that you can't see, <laughs> and explained the Klan's opposition to Al Smith's presidential campaign in 1928. A 1933 article announced the sale of the Waxhatchee Ku Klux Klan Clavern, their uh, building where they met. The building was repurposed into a horse barn. Perhaps that's appropriate. <coughs> the article says that the local Klan den was not disbanding, though. Places in the heart is set in 1935, and it seems clear that the Klan was still active in Ellis County during the mid-1930s. The film captures, I think, the racial ambivalence of, quote, respectable, in quote, white people in the, in the 1930s South. In one scene, Miss Edna, children at her side, watches dispassionately as vigilantes drag the lifeless body of Wiley in front of the Spalding home. However, as the plot unfolds, she shows great forgiveness and compassion for Mose, who had stolen some silver spoons from the Spalding household. Places in the Heart concludes with a surreal communion scene shot in the sanctuary of the Bethel Methodist Church. Prior to the observance of the Lord's Supper, the congregation sang the old Fanny Crosby standard, Blessed Assurance. Then the aged pastor read a truncated passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the well-known love chapter. As the communion elements were distributed, the congregational scene transforms. Each of the film characters, even those deceased, reappear. Miss Margaret, for instance, took the hand of her estranged husband, though Viola, his former paramour, is seen driving from town with her husband. The Texas Playboys are there at the communion, and they probably needed as much church attendance as they could get. The banker, who sought to foreclose uh, Miss Edna's place, sat in front of the Spaldings, and Mr. Will and Mose received communion together. Miss Edna was attended in, by her deceased husband, Royce, who was seated next to Wiley, the African-American youth who was lynched for killing Sheriff Spaulding. In the background, a small choir sang in the garden a maudlin sentimental hymn written in 1912 and very popular with rural southern churches. This presentation 
is a labor of love driven by two uh, conflicting impulses. Some years ago, while attending this conference, in fact, sitting just over there, I felt an overwhelming sorrow sweep over me. A grief uh, fostered, I think, by the chilling realization that a way of life was dying. While listening to one of the presenters reflect on his experiences on the Blackland Prairie from many years ago, I penned this freeform poem, and I beg your indulgence as I read this to you. I suppose I should apologize ahead of time. Uh, this was sort of stream of consciousness, and I made no effort to um, soften what will no doubt be some jarring images of my youth. About a year ago, I realized that the world of my youth had died, leaving me an orphan, motherless, a restless sojourner. She was not a perfect mother, no deeply flawed, but mother nonetheless. Pardon this reminiscence of my home, the womb of my remembrance. Knee-high red sodas, moon pies, bar shops, the unmistakable aroma of witch hazel and butch wax, sweaty preachers, funeral home fans, fried okra and enchiladas, Merle Haggard and Tommy James and the Shondells, Piggly Wiggly grocery stores and the five and dime, coconut snow cones, hires root beer for a nickel, Lou Brock and Cardinal Red, Daryl K. Royal, Harry Carey and Blackie Sherrod, drive-in movies, Gunsmoke, and the Roy Rogers Show. People with manners, starch white shirts on Sundays, aluminum Christmas trees, black and white television, Walter Cronkite, and that damned war in Vietnam, King James Bible readings, Marchman's Department Store, the Dairy Mart, Sandlot Baseball, just for fun, crawdad fishing, blue-haired elderly ladies at church, horny toads, big red ants, blue bonnets, Indian paintbrush, droughts, tornadoes, amazing grace, and bringing in the sheaves, the Texas Eagle Railroad, Chuck Taylor All-Stars, Dixiecrats, Shotguns, prayer schools, duck and school prayers, I mean to say, duck and cover drills, lunch lines, and fudge sickles. Segregation, Jim Crow, Ollie, the only black woman that I knew, paternalism, Robert E. Lee, George Wallace, hypocrites, racial jokes, black athletes for the first time in the locker room, integration, Aretha Franklin and Marvin Gaye, and the invisible Mexicans. She's dead now, this mother of mine, but I daily live in her shadow with whispers in my ear, son, watch for change for change's sake. Thank you. I have to follow that? Yes. <laughs> I did write the schedule. <laughs> <laughs>
coming down. Uh, we'll see if the, all the technology works. Is the mic down? I don't know. So I am very much the new kid in town, even though I've been here for seven years. Okay. 2015. <laughs> 2022. <laughs> seven. I grew up in outside of Washington, D.C., uh, so I'm a suburban kid, uh, environmental historian, southern historian by training. Uh, so I'm coming late to Texas history, and I still can't figure out why uh, I ended up in commerce, but somehow I ended up next to one of the most important toxic waste sites <laughs> around uh, in East Texas, and really interesting then cotton history, rural history, environmental history. All this stuff is just right literally in my doorstep. Um, and so it seemed appropriate to start digging, not literally, <laughs> metaphorically, uh, into what was there. And so what you're going to see here is where I am now. There's still plenty left to do. i um, realizing second books take a long time to write. Uh, and so I've done some research uh, at Baylor, some at, in Austin in the uh, state cleanup records, done some online stuff but I still have a lot to do. So uh, one of the reasons I'm presenting here is to get a sense from you all of where I should be looking for more information to connect all this and bring it all together. Okay. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> So the core questions uh, that are framing this research, there are a couple. Uh, one is, what would it look like to think of Northeast Texas as a post-industrial region, uh, along the lines of, say, Detroit? A lot of times, I think we don't usually think of post-industrial and rural in the same framework. Rural is very much agricultural, which is about landscapes that are open, green space, open space, that's the kind of language we use. Uh, but if you've driven through Wolf City, if you've driven through downtown Greenville, there's a lot of rust, there's a lot of old industry, uh, and a lot of ways that I think the language of the post-industrial history, the rust health history, can actually inform how we think about this largely cotton region. And so one of my goals is to connect those two and try to make sense of that. Uh, the other is, is really to to zoom way out and see the extent to which places like Greenville, Commerce, Northeast Texas are connected to not just regional history, southern history, but also national and then ultimately international uh, history. And so as you see the title there, uh, Copper Mines, Cotton Fields in Northeast Texas, a lot of what I found as I just trace this stuff around is connections to places like this which is Butte, Montana. Anyone ever been to Butte, Montana? All right. uh, that is the largest in the world, which is the smokestack that was created in Butte, Montana because a bunch of cattle farmers got really mad when all their cows died because of arsenic contamination, arsenic poisoning. Uh, and so I'll give you some details on this as we go later on in the presentation. Uh, but a lot of what I want to help you think through and help myself think through is what are the connections between a place like Commerce, Texas, and Butte, Montana? Uh, and the short answer is arsenic, which is also then connected to copper. And we are all even at this moment surrounded by copper, dug out of the ground somewhere. A lot of that copper has been dug out of the ground in Arizona, Montana, uh, Michigan originally, and a few other places, but also globally. Uh, most copper now comes from Chile and a few other places. And so, ultimately, this project uses the historical approach of commodity history, which, on one level, is a really boring way to do history, because you suck all the people out. Right. Uh, the key is, in my writing, I'm trying to do this, is, is you suck all the people out, you look at the connections, and then you find all the people that are connected by this, and put the people back in. Oh. And that's the second part. Uh, but 
what you really find is the way that people are entangled in these webs that didn't even know they were entangled with each other. And a lot of this, as you can imagine, goes back to the railroads and what the railroads are doing. And so the goal, when I think about the book structure, then, is to try to put cotton um, and uh, arsenic and then copper all in the same frame and look at the ways that these connect people. And that's ultimately the goal of this. And so to move on, then, give you a Sanborn map there of Commerce, Texas. That's downtown, right over here. So this is the railroad tracks of the Cotton Belt. And then to the top right is the area we're going to be talking about a little bit today. And this is obviously set against the backdrop of what a lot of you know, which is that Texas is the first, first in the nation up through the 1950s, 60s, and even beyond in cotton production. Uh, up to a quarter, maybe even a little more, of cotton production in the United States is Texas. Uh, and so towns like Commerce are minor hubs in this industry. The railroads connect the town to the rest of the commodity networks. There's also oil mills, seed mills, right, gins, all this machinery that goes along with cotton that I don't need to explain to any of you in sort of. A lot of the story, though, that I'm realizing uh, as I dig into this uh, deals with an era of cotton production that most of us don't know as much about. For most of us, I think the image that, that Sam brought to us is the one that we remember with cotton, uh, connected to sharecropping, connected to uh, this history of small farms. Uh, but as cotton becomes more mechanized, and as the farms get larger and more and more people come off the land, we tend to zoom out. We tend to fade to black, uh, and we focus more on other things. Uh, but really, the history that I'm looking at is ultimately a 1950s, 1960s focused History. And this is all connected then to the High Yield Company, which manufactured, formulated, and distributed a number of agricultural chemicals from its commerce location. And they opened in what looks like 1951, uh, but there's also pesticide distribution going on before then at that plant. They're manufacturing uh, and processing arsenic, uh, arsenic trioxide, which is used as a cotton desiccant, and then also MSMA, which I won't give you the chemistry which is used on golf courses as much as for Johnson grass on uh, cotton fields. And so that is ultimately then connected to what's happening here. So arsenic is a quiet collaborator in the agricultural revolution in the cotton fields. A lot of this goes back to the New Deal era programs as well. Mechanical pickers and strippers were rather finicky machines requiring plants of a certain height and mold development, as well as relatively clean rows. Mechanical harvests also required plants whose leaves had been removed or defoliated. Uh, usually in Northeast Texas in the Blackland Prairie area, they use desiccants, which dry out and kill the plant. Uh, failure to do so would stain the lint, increase moisture content, and disrupt ginning. And ultimately, that's something that the factories, the, the gins, and then the people processing the cotton are uh, pushing for drier cotton and cotton that meets their certain specifications. Ultimately, arsenic is used not because it's an amazing chemical, but because it's a cheap chemical. And that's what's going to drive a lot of the stories. It's really not so much a commodity history as a, a story of who can uh, get rid of their waste and make some money in the process. Uh, and so really, the, the South, the Cotton South, especially Black Land Prairie, becomes a dumping ground for the mining industry. Uh, and they somehow convince them to pay for it. <laughs> That's the tragedy of the Illinois. Uh, by the mid-1960s, Texans used over 45,000 strippers, and then they applied about 5 million pounds of arsenic acid to their cotton fields. Uh, that figure goes up to about 2 million acres of cotton that they're treating with this by 1971. Uh, and a big part of the story is the EPA is created in 1970, and they start going after a lot of this. Arsenic is one of the first targets for the EPA. But they go after the mining industry first, and so, uh, where did all the arsenic come from? Well, I'll give you some of that. But it was processed through local nodes of production along railroad lines. And as you start tracing this, uh, the, the phrase Union Pacific Railroad <laughs> comes up more and more and more. And then you realize that the Union Pacific Railroad spent a lot of money on loyalists. And they were very good at this. They would 
town to town, fighting all these battles, and the same playbook, uh, and they were really good at dealing with regulation and limiting their liability. And so this is just looking east from basically the entire What year is your picture? Do you know? So I don't have a date on this one. I know it's 50s in the 60s. The plant shuts down in uh, 1970, 71. I think 72 is the official January 72. And that's why I'm trying to figure out is looking for pictures of this. Uh, but also, uh, I've been able to find a lot of arguments from the farmers. Uh, as regulation looms, the first thing the companies do is go to their senators, go to the congressmen and say, we're important. Uh, and so this, as you can see, is the Pope Papers. He's the head agriculture committee in the Senate. These, these papers are available. And the companies then get area partners. This one's uh, the Prosper Cooperative Gen Association and local processors to write letters like this. You know what I mean? Or I need to read it out loud. Uh, we have been gin and cotton in the Collin County area for 23 years. During this period of time, we have gin and cotton that has been desiccated with arsenic acid so they could be harvested with mechanical strippers. It is necessary for the cotton producer to use some means of preparing cotton. And then they go on to essentially say, we have found that stripper cotton treatment with arsenic acid has enabled us to do a better job of cleaning the cotton. And ultimately, this is interesting part, possible residues on the cotton brought to the gym for processing has not caused any hardship or injuries to personnel. There's another one from Wolf City. We, the farmers of Wolf City, feel like we must continue to receive our So I think there's a whole pack of these letters, the same basic idea. Uh, and then this one I have because it's two voluntary purchasing groups, which is the company that owns the high-yield plant. Uh, and they use a lot of the same arguments. And they go back to the image of cotton picking and laboring and the cost of this. Uh, what I didn't appreciate going in is how much mechanical harvested cotton is full of trash. And that's part of why they're using arsenic acid, but functionally what that means is the arsenic is getting all over the plants and then they are harvesting. And the ultimate uh, numbers I found on this, it's hard to get good numbers, but the ratio is two to one trash to ultimate uh, gin to cotton. And so what they end up doing with this, because functionally you cannot destroy arsenic, because uh, it's an element, is they burn the gin trash. And so you have them right next to the picture. You have the chemical plant, and then right to the left, and then a quarter mile north, all around this are also all the cotton gins that are then ginning the cotton, <coughs> the same arsenic that goes through here, and then also put it in the air as they burn the gin trash. And so it's a horrible, beautiful, beautiful cycle, is really what I'm finding, all connected. I love that last line. Let us know how we can help. Uh, we assure you if there ever comes a time that the producer needs help to continue the use of arsenic acid, please don't hesitate to call. Uh, ultimately, the story for commerce is that the plant is shut down by Texas regulatory action, which is a weird thing to say. <laughs> 1967, Texas passes a clean water bill that they then use to start cracking down on the water pouring off of the site. I'll show you some basics here. Uh, this is also very much tied to racial geography. So downhill from the plant is Sail Creek, which flows this way, and that is the Norris community, which is the uh, segregated part. And so a lot of the argument then becomes arguments between the railroad com uh, company, the high yield company, which owns the site, and then the co cotton gin company, and then also the furniture company that buys the building and continues to use it with largely black employees in a building that's functionally encased in Russia. And so ultimately the cleanup is 1993, connected to Superfund, uh, but the site is shut down in the 70s. And then what follows between is really 20 years of them cleaning up the site enough, but all the meetings are between the executives and the Texas 
doing the enforcement actions in Austin or outside of the town. Uh, so a lot of the memory of the site in town is it being open in the 70s and then it being quietly cleaned up. No one really knows what's happening. There's no fences, there's nothing set up until 92 uh, when Ivory Moore is mayor, African American mayor in commerce. There's a whole story there. So I can answer any questions about that. This becomes the largest uh, immediate removal action in state history up to that point for cleanups. So it's not in Houston, it's not connected to oil, it's connected to arson. Mm -hmm. And that's what it looks like now. <clears throat> One of the interesting things for me as I think about the connection between Montana and Superfund remediation there, so environmental cleanup there, and arsenic cleanup in the south, is the south is full of mounds like that. They bury the stuff on site, they dig up the soil, they concentrate it, they put a cap on it, and they move on. But if you look at what's happening across the west, so there's uh, the Clark Fork Superfund cleanup, the largest Superfund site in the nation. Uh, they've created a whole new uh, riverfront walks they've gone through and dredged up all the material and got rid of it and totally redone, it's like millions and millions of dollars. The old works is now a golf course. So they've done a whole a tourist oriented redevelopment there using federal money. And so for a lot of Western areas, functionally, remediation has become federal investment for tourism. And a lot of what you see in places like Bryan, Texas, which has a similar aspect to commerce, is a mound. Usually on the wrong side of the tracks, still surrounded by razor wire. The other one is Tacoma, Washington, where a lot of the arsenic is processed that is now, of course, in the river wall near Seattle. And so as we think about the legacies of cotton in the area, I think there's a lot more to be done on public memory connected to these things, but also thinking about what does it mean to reshape the landscape and actually do some kind of economic development, what is possible, and ultimately what is the community willing do with such a site. There's a lot of models for redevelopment, for reuse, adaptive reuse. But what's interesting to me thinking about the West is there's a deep sense of pride that goes with the mining industry. That yes, it was hazardous, yes, it was toxic, but we were building America. We built the, you know, we, we mined the copper that went into the battleships that, that were sunk in the Japanese. We fought in World War II. We built America by building the automobile. So we built Detroit. I don't see as much of that here related to cotton. So I'd love to hear from you all what the, what the memory of cotton is and what it might look like to think about a site like the Wolf City Seaton or the Commerce High Yield site in more, maybe more of a Western way. I don't know. And ultimately, the history then of race and segregation and cotton and industry are all wrapped together in ways that are difficult to disentangle. So, as an outsider, I'd love to hear what you all think the story really is, what the takeaway is, and what the memory is around these sites, and what should we do. So, that's my presentation.
uh, VPG, they're headquartered in Bonham. They declared bankruptcy in the 90s, but they're still around in Bonham. And then they ship all the equipment to Houston. So, there's a super fun site to use. Crystal Kevin. Yeah, a, a lot of it has to do with uh, what can be done there now. I was just, this summer was in Pittsburgh, and uh, you know, the old homestead still site there, they're repurposing that area. Uh, co commercial, residential, but it's also right along the river there, so it, it's got advantages to repurposing of some of these other rural areas and these areas specifically. Uh, you gotta think of maybe some other purpose for it. Yeah. Then a residential uh, high rise area. They got Costco's now, right <coughs> where the homestead mills were. Capitalism always wins. History's not over. <laughs> And isn't it a problem not just of repurposing, but actually doing a cleanup rather than just just piling up the cat? Yeah, so as I think it's a bigger book project, a lot of what I'm focusing on is, is concentration and dilution. A lot of what the copper mines run into is by bringing all the ore in, they're concentrating it. The smokestack is an attempt to dilute it and just spread it all over the West. Uh, that doesn't work for the regulators, so they functionally do the same thing by putting it in rail cars and shipping it down to the Blackburn Prairie, where people here would spread it all over the soil. And things get really weird when you start thinking about the action level. So they keep debating how, how clean is too clean, or how clean is clean enough. And the numbers they ultimately settle on are so low that every cotton field in this area is a toxic waste site. Because our thing doesn't go away. And so then they argue back and forth about what's an acceptable amount. And they get these bizarre scenarios. Imagine a kid goes out and eats dirt every day for 10 years <laughs> in the backyard. Will that kid have a more greater chance of cancer? Andrew, was, no. there, uh, was there not, in fact, some uh, cancer clusters or disease clusters in commerce in the Norris community related to this site? So that's a, another fascinating thing about the timeline because the damage is really done in the 60s and 70s. The workers and the people who live immediately downstream while the plant was operational are the ones who really have the most cancer issues and all these other issues. Once you shut down the site, it becomes a cleanup. It's about containing the waste. By the 90s, it's about removing the soil and trying to clean up whatever's left. But the vast majority of the arsenic is already gone by that it's washed down the river, it's in the bodies of the people. And so it's too late, really, by that time. But there's there's a number of lawsuits, absolutely. There's a class action lawsuit that they win, is my understanding. If they, they did win. That they did win eventually. And I'm still working on the legal <coughs> papers. I also, even yesterday, I came across uh, part of the bankruptcy settlement is the company had to spend $800,000 on a wetland to make up for polluting the creek. And I'm still not sure where that is. That was in the 90s. When Dr. Conrad was here, uh -huh. he was very, really wanted to redo this, those wetlands out uh, south of town. Mm -hmm. Was this something like that? So I was on the Hunt County cab yesterday trying to figure it out. I don't know yet. Do you know, in terms of Brian, what the impact of those cancer clusters, that, does it relate to racial issues? Was it a, a traditionally black community there that saw the bulk of those? Or So part of what makes it a fascinating uh, comparative study <coughs> is that the, the activist who's in front of the TCEQ, these other environmental uh, regulators, is a educated white guy with Brian. And with commerce, it's very much tied to the Ivory Moore in the African American community in the 90s. Uh, and so I'm still trying to figure out how comparative to make that study. It's certainly a working class area of Bryan. The Urban and Bryan is Finn Feather Lake. It's no name lake, Finn Feather Lake. And right now, actually, even as we speak, they're dredging out one of the lakes. 
Uh, but downstream was a, one of the rod and reel Teddy Roosevelt style uh, boats. And so it's just a very different mm -hmm. people being affected in that way. When I lived in Bryan last, I lived about two blocks from one of those lakes because there was cheap apartments store over there that mm -hmm. the students that got and loved. And I have no idea. No, we didn't love them. We hated them, but we were pretty affordable, right? And I don't know what's been done since then because that the growth there has been so dramatic since I left. It's a very similar geography on all these sites. There's a railroad line, it's usually downhill from downtown, usually east of downtown, close enough that you could walk, uh, but also that you'll see low rise in the distance. <laughs> I don't know how it affects your story. Stop me anytime. Uh, my husband grew up, on, uh, at three months old, he moved to Commerce from Cundy to Pastor Colin Burns, along with three other houses. And um, he lived on Mangum Street and Morris, M O R S E Street. Graduated in 1954 for Commerce, went to Dumas uh, near Amarillo, he worked two years on the oil fields in order to get money to come back to Commerce and be able to pay his tuition through the college and did that. But while he was doing his college years, he worked at the Fairleigh Gin uh, and along with two other, three other people and they were to stand at each corner of the trailer and then they had the suction tube and they bounced it back between and that was his job every summer of his, or every year the gym was open throughout his university years. Uh, I know for a fact that one of the guys died of cancer of the pancreas. The other three have died of the same <coughs> identical brain tumor. Same named brain tumor. And uh, I just thought I'd add that to your story, and I know who all of, the, all of them are. Um, so, uh, and I will tell you, I personally worked at the bank starting in 1959, and Mr. Connor, who was the manager of High Yield, would bring his money in, and also uh, all my farmers came in, and I figured their share of their of their checks that went to their landowner and their share and all that. So I, I got a lot of cotton history, but I was in the bank <laughs> doing and, it. And that makes the story even more complicated because they're a cooperative with their farmer and entities. What was the name of the doctor? How you always show up? This is for Dr. Teller. Obviously, you concentrated on Ellis County, but what other communities? for sites or movies. Did you come across those? Sure. Uh, I'll mention two or three of them. I, um, the films that were shot in Waxahachie, uh, I wasn't there for when they shot the three of them in the 1980s. I was married and <coughs> moved away by that point. But the, those, all four of those films that I mentioned were shot around Waxahachie, some in Dallas, the Bonnie and Clyde, some, some of the uh, location sites were in my wife's hometown uh, in Rowlett, which was not a big town. And, you know, in those days it was a wide spot in the road. Uh, and also in Dallas. My old um, high school principal, Mr. L.T. Felty retired uh, after my freshman year in high school. I probably scared him out of his career. Uh, and he became the sort of film broker uh, that would work, he worked so hard to bring these, um, the movie industry into Waxahachie. And, and I, I would assume brought a lot of money into the, into the city as well. Texas Ranger was filmed in Dallas and Fort Worth a lot. Yeah, they did one scene, uh, one of uh, those Texas Ranger episodes in Wiley, where Kathy and I live. Garland, too. I had Garland, to, I had yeah. to be an extra, but I wasn't in it. Yeah. They cut me out. Yeah, they cut her out. <laughs> <laughs> Is that 
Is there any interaction in Waxahachie, like sort of the generation of the first community out of this? Any connection to the Renaissance Festival being founded around the same time this is going on? I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> it, I've never been into a Scarlet Fair, um, and I, 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 I'm just trying to be funny. Um, as far as I know, there's no connection. I know that the people that live in Waxahachie are more embarrassed by that than they are supportive of it. That's really funny. Yeah. Did, did I work in the Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I <laughs> Forgive me. I'm sorry. Did, do they mind the money it brings in? I don't know how much money, because it's outside of walks. You'd have a better feel for that than um, I do. Do the people that work there, I guess, do they? So, do they it depends. Um, when you have a Renaissance Festival, you can have two things going on. You have a lot of temporary local jobs, right? Uh, which a lot of people will fill those from the temporary season. Uh, and you also have the, the two kinds of entertainers. You have entertainers who are from the local area, who kind of do it as a hobby, and come in for just the run of the festival. And then you have the entertainers who run the circuit across the entire country. And you know these, those entertainers will run seven, eight different festivals during the year, depending on what times they happen, right? And so, um, it's not a whole lot, of, so a lot of the money goes into the site itself and keeping that going. Um, but what happens is a lot of times the folks leave in the evening, right, because it closes by 7 o'clock. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of the restaurant growth in Waxahachie is sort of tied to that after hours business, right? Yeah. A lot of hotels have popped up in the same area down there. Um, some of the folks involved in running the festival have gotten really deeply involved in Waxahachie politics. Um, the last general manager, before he retired, uh, ran for city council a couple of times and ran the auction house in Waxahachie. And so it brings a lot of people sort of to live there and get connected to it, but exactly how much that goes where, other than the owners, the Hollyfields, and the uh, other families, I can't remember, I'm not sure. I wasn't there when Scarborough Fair was running, so we jousted, but it it wasn't, it wasn't on horseback. <laughs> so when you think about how, how that area has been represented in the film, uh, do you think over the years it has gotten a fair uh, treatment? I, I, I think mean, the, so. The Southern Sheriff is this classic uh, cardboard image. I think, I think so. I mean, I, obviously I see it from my slant. I think the thing that surprises me about um, uh, Tender Mercies and Places in the Heart, those two films in particular, is uh, the lack of, of, of showing the, the architecture, what walks of edgy people tend to take a great deal of pride in. Those gingerbread houses, for instance, that Chautauqua, I, I, is there another Chautauqua still in existence? In, in Enid, Oklahoma, been? Enid, Oklahoma, they still have Chautauqua. Uh, and, and this thing is, is, they keep it, I graduated from the eighth grade mm -hmm. in that Chautauqua building, and they still use it to this day. So it, I, that part uh, kind of bothered me that, that I don't think. All right, if, there, if that's it, we'll wrap up the session. And Thank you all so much. Thank you. Give us a few minutes. I think we're going to get lunch set up.